On this episode of Forgotten Rails, the West River Railroad. Railroad fever was infecting the country. Merchants wanted an outlet for their products. That all changed after the turn of the century. Behind me is where one of the worst disasters struck the line. The whole bridge collapsed. Since railroads were introduced to the United States, thousands of lines have been built. And while some are alive and going strong, others have long since disappeared. I'm your host, Timothy W. Lawrence. Along with my sidekick, Ares the Siberian Husky, we're going to search the nation, exploring and sharing the history of these rails. Whether abandoned, exempt, or currently active, if there's a history, we'll find it. So hop on up, because it's all aboard for Forgotten Rails. The West River Valley of Southern Vermont with its scenic roads, rolling mountains, and rustic structures offers pure Vermont beauty. As you round the bend on Route 30 in Newfane, your eyes, undoubtedly, will catch the sight of two old abutments in the river. Dozens of motorists drive by every day. But how many people would realize that less than 80 years ago, an active railroad crossed overhead here? In the 1800s, Southern Vermont realized it needed a faster, more efficient mode of transportation. Its answer? A railroad. Fortunes of the West River Valley were improving as after the period after the Civil War. Railroad fever was infecting the country, and the residents of the West River Valley were no different than anybody else. And they, merchants wanted an outlet for their products, and they wanted a way to travel back and forth between the villages along the river and to other parts of the country. Originating in Brattleboro, the railroad followed the Connecticut River one mile north, where it then veered off and followed the West River Valley. It then traveled through Dummerston, Newfane, Townsend, and Jamaica, before arriving here at the South Londonderry Terminal, a total distance of 36 miles. Originally, it was supposed to go from Brattleboro to Londonderry and then over connect to Whitehall, New York. But funding never came through for all that. There's 1,700 people in this town in 2012, and there was about the same, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little less, back in the turn of the century. So it hasn't, and mostly it was because of these people coming uh, up the railroad. That's a good girl. Oh, hi there. When the railroad was completed in 1880, it was claimed that the trip from Brattleboro to South London area would only take two hours. Well, in reality, it was closer to four. It still beat the two-day trek by horse and buggy. Initially, they ran three trains a day, one freight train and two passenger trains. But some of my schedules have shown up to five trains a day. The train schedules tended to follow the rising and falling economy. At the time, of course, there wasn't automobiles, and so a trip to Brattleboro was a pretty major trip, and this just really cut that down. It also helped out with people that wanted to sell goods or receive goods um, outside of the local valley. Whether milk from the company in Brattleboro, local lumber and farm products, or even mail, the railroad was essential to delivering them in a timely manner. Another forgotten aspect of this railroad were the old quarries. In the late 1800s, a handful of quarries formed on Black Mountain in Dummerston. This railroad was the key to shipping granite from these quarries to Brattleboro and the East Coast. Its Dummerston white granite was used in street work, monuments, and structures including such prestigious buildings as the Plaza Hotel in Manhattan. All this granite production brought lots of revenue to the town, state, and railroad. And even when the railroad was on its last leg, the quarry bought the rights to the six miles of track between Brattleboro and Dummerston in order to continue production. Without this railroad, it would have been all but impossible to get the stone from these quarries out. A successful business can adapt to change, but at a certain point, Either it becomes redundant and it goes away or it's success and stays. If you ask somebody back in, like, say, the 1890s, after it had been for 10 years, 
they wouldn't say, they would say that probably the benefits outweighed the troubles. <laughs> that all changed after the turn of the century, I think. There was a lot of, a lot of derailments. A lot of it had to do with being the narrow gauge and just the terrain, the geography, and the storms and being close to the river. It had a lot of problems. Behind me is where one of the worst disasters struck the line on August 18th, 1886. As the southbound mixed train crossed the West River, the wooden trestle collapsed, dropping the entire train, including a passenger car, 40 feet to the water below. While the bridge was a total loss, the engine was raised and rebuilt. And by some miracle, only two lives were lost in the end. After the collapse, the railroad upgraded to a steel trestle. In part, this was preparing for the upgrade to standard gauge, which took place in 1905. The conversion to standard gauge allowed them now to avoid having to offload and reload in Brattleboro. With the rails being unified to standard gauge, the trains from the West River Railroad could now continue on any track, rather than having to reload everything onto standard gauge cars. Unfortunately, the, the time period was that the automobile was starting to be pretty widely used. The train was faster than a horse and buggy, but uh, the automobile definitely was faster than, than the train. <laughs> Their timing wasn't great on uh, switching to the standard gauge. Even with the upgrades, there was still a lot of hardship which struck the line. From mudslides and boulders falling onto the tracks, to the flood of 1927, which devastated much of the railroad. The 27 flood basically ended you know, the economic viability of the line. Of course, in 1929, we had the Depression, and at that point, the country slid into the Depression. When the railroad came back in 31, basically, all of the business had evaporated or moved to trucks by that time. Despite trying new renovations, such as the use of a gasoline-powered rail bus, upkeep and a lack of business due to the rise of automobiles ultimately proved to be too much. And in 1936, all except what the quarry now owned was abandoned or scrapped. Even though the railroad has long since been torn up, there are still numerous places remnants can be seen. Even if you're walking through the woods, you may stumble across an old remnant or two. It can really get your imagination going as to what was once there. While a lot of the old line has been converted for other uses such as roads, power line right-of-ways, and trails, other segments have altogether been destroyed. In the late 50s and early 60s, the Army Corps of Engineers came through and built flood control dams along the river. While this was good for public safety, it unfortunately destroyed parts of the railroad. Seeing that the river in Townsend and Jamaica provided perfect locations, large dams were built in each town, causing the river to flood out entire villages and the railroad. Despite the fact that large areas have been destroyed, or now lie on private property, one can still make a full day out of hiking the public sections. Out of the original 36 miles, 16 remain as rail trail segments. The first is a three and a half mile long stretch that runs from Brattleboro to Dummerston, Vermont. Parking can be found at the south end off of Spring Tree Road in Brattleboro, and the north end off of Rice Farm Road in Dummerston. This section runs along the West River, cuts through the woods, and shares a power line right of way. The next segment is in Townsend, Vermont. Parking can be found at the south end next to the Townsend Lake Dam, and the north end at the parking area along the old Route 30 across from Ritchie's Lane. This segment travels two and a quarter miles along the old Route 30, close to where the railroad once ran. Just be aware that this entire segment rests in a flood zone, meaning that at certain times of year it may be flooded or too dangerous to access. The last segment stretches from Jamaica to South Londonderry, Vermont, some ten and a half miles. And while it is one continuous trail, it can easily be split into sections, depending on how far you'd like to hike. Parking can be found at Jamaica State Park on Salmon Hole Lane in Jamaica, Vermont, Ball Mountain Lake at the end of Ball Mountain Lake Access Road in Jamaica, Vermont, Winhall Brook Camping Area at the end of Winhall Brook Station Road in South Londonderry, Vermont, and at the end of West River Street in South Londonderry, Vermont. This segment offers some good sections of railroad bed hiking, 
along with some adventurous wooded trails and exciting opportunities such as the switchbacks up and over Ball Mountain Dam and a tower walk hikers can go out on to enjoy the view of the lake. And if you're truly into it, you can even rent a campsite that rests where the railroad once ran while at Jamaica State Park. And a little added bonus for today. As you're hiking, you may get lucky and see some wildlife. Or... What is this? An anxious pup. Hmm? I'm 10 feet away from you, love. You're funny. I'd also like to take this moment to mention that some of these places either have an entry fee or rules. And even if the rules aren't something that you'd naturally want to... So as I was saying, these places sometimes have rules. And even if they're not what you would naturally choose to do or even want to do, they're there for a reason and it's important that you follow them. Excuse me, sir, didn't you see the sign? No dogs. Dog? I don't have a dog. What are you talking about? That right there, sir. That's not a dog. This is my baby. Yeah, follow the rules. Another thing to keep in mind before you start hiking the trails is you might want to stop and get some food and water. One of my favorite spots to stop is the Harmonyville store in, you got it, Harmonyville, Vermont. They have good food, good pricing, and they're right across the street from Depot Road, which is home to one of the original station houses. Of the original 10 station houses, six still remain. While some are in their original locations, others have been moved or converted into private residences. The South Londonderry Terminal, however, is still accessible to the public. You know, Aries, for being gone so long, there's still quite a bit of this railroad left. From old bridge abutments to station houses, even this rail trail we're on. To date, there are over 1,700 rail trails in America. How many can you get out and hike?